Welcome everyone to the ninth lecture of our course business to business marketing. Just imagine a situation uh, you know when you are making some purchases uh, for your house, maybe your monthly items, uh, your grocery or your you know anything that you buy for your cosmetics or anything for your home. So, it it's still uh, looks sometimes uh, you know complicated to us. Now, imagine a situation where a company like Tata Motors or a company like you know Bharat Forge or a company like you know uh, BHEL uh, you know uh, India Limited now when they are making purchases how they would be doing it right how they would be planning their uh, purchasing process. Now, if you compare yourself against uh, you know a company like BHEL or any PSU like Steel Authority of India Limited you will realize that even if you want, if you think well, you plan well, you can make some savings in your monthly expenditure, right. So, how about the same concept if we apply to the firms, how much can they save? And suppose you can save, let us say, even 2 percent of your entire purchase uh, revenue, if you even uh, save 2 percent. So, that might be if your monthly expenditure is 5000 rupees you are saving let us say around 100 rupees right. But if a company is, uh, is spending about let us say uh, 100 crores, even 2 percent of it is uh, let us say uh, something like 2 crores. So, now we can imagine that the purchasing process of organizations that that is why it becomes very uh, important, very vital because it has a direct impact on the you know organizations profitability right. So, so, today we are going to talk about the Sates model of industrial buying behavior in which he explains about what are the various uh, you know expectations of the purchasing agents or of the people who are involved in the purchase process. For example, the purchasing agents who could be a purchasing manager or you know anybody a procurement manager if even a finance manager or you have quality control people like engineers and somebody from the other departments like the manufacturing department who are the basically users right. Now, what is their expectation and what is the buying process uh, involved in the industrial uh, in the firms right and how uh, you know they make a choice of their brand and supplier and what kind of a decision do they make? Is it a autonomous decision that they make or a joint decision that they make? So, all these we are going to you know uh, discuss today in this uh, uh, lecture ok. So, let us start with the first uh, point that is the expectation of the decision makers. Now, if you look at it one uh, here this point right. So, expectation of the purchasing uh, of the decision makers for example, about the suppliers and brands. Now, it says it depends on 5 factors. Now, the first factor as it has been mentioned here is the background of the individual as we had discussed in the last lecture that you know uh, every uh, be it a firm or a household in fact, the decision is always taken by a human being right not a machine and human beings cannot be devoid of emotions. So, what kind of a person uh, is leading or heading the organization and what is his background, where he has come from, how risk taking he is, what kind of a personality he has got all these things can have a profound effect on the purchasing process and the selection of the supplier vendors and the brands. So, the second point is information sources right. So, how what kind of information is available to us and then we have uh, the third point which is active search, fourth point we talk will talk about is perceptual distortion. Now, whatever information you have got now how do you perceive it? Now, sometimes four people get the same information all four of them might be uh, perceiving it very differently right. So, that will depend on what kind of a uh, uh, image you have in your mind, what kind of an impression you are carrying in your mind. Accordingly, you will try to uh, figure it out and you will try to understand it that way. And maybe the last point is the satisfaction with the past purchases. Now, let us look at one each one of them. So, when we are talking about the background of the individuals, three things matter very seriously. The first thing being you know the different educational backgrounds. Now, for example, let us say uh, uh, as we saw the people from the different uh, functional areas like the production, you know the quality, the finance, the marketing everybody can get involved in, during a buying process. So, 
what kind of a educational background do they come from? Now, for example, if somebody is an engineer and some uh, let us say another person is from the finance, uh, uh, you know, he has done something like chartered accountancy or some courses in commerce. Now, both these people will have different kind of uh, maybe uh, thought processes. Now, a guy who is more into engineering is maybe he will, uh, you know, be more into machines, designs and all and he will try to go get into more into quality and all these things. But as very uh, person from the finance and uh, who has studied commerce or something, he will try to uh, look at from a more from a finance point of view, right. Similarly, if somebody is a uh, you know guy from design or marketing or something, right, he will look into how uh, the product can be made more attractive and you know it looks uh, more appealing to the customer, right. Similarly, you know according to the kind of functional area even the expectations also changes, right. So, if my goal is to uh, achieve the best quality product and I am being promoted uh, because of uh, the efficiency of the product or the quality of the product, then I would like to always ahead of the quality team, I would like to improve the quality of the product, right. But if I am guy from finance and I am being awarded, rewarded because of my uh, financial performance, if the amount of money I can save, right. Uh, or I can increase the profitability of the firm. If that is the way I am getting rewarded, then I would always try to cut down the cost at any uh, at uh, all points, okay. So, now these kind of expectations will vary with the roles that you are playing in the organizations, right. And all these people together will be responsible for the purchasing in the B2B organizations. The third thing is again, you know, the personal lifestyles. Now, for example, somebody may have be a very conservative person, very orthodox person, on the other hand, somebody can be a you know party animal, can be a you know kind of guy who is who loves uh, you know a flamboyant life and all. Now, when you have this kind of personalities heading the different divisions of the organizations, there will always be a clash in their approach to their work, right? So these things uh, uh, makes a significant impact. Similarly, the sources of information. Now we have seen in information sources in the B two market is largely accounted from the sales people, you know, uh, exhibitions and trade shows, uh, conferences, uh, trade news and word of mouth, right. So, if somebody is speaking good about you, that automatically, uh, you know, permeates in the market and percolates in the market and uh, other people also come to know about you and that gives a very positive impact. But the point is, you know, are uh, everybody having the same access to the information? No, obviously not. Now, for example, look at the purchasing agent. Now, purchasing agents receive disproportionately greater exposure to the commercial sources. Why? Because that is their job. Their job is to find, you know, the different kinds of markets, the different kinds of sellers uh, and their uh, different levels of quality and all. So, they, they go for different conferences, they attend different seminars, they diff attend different trade shows and uh, it is their job to always uh, search for information. Now, on the other hand, if you see the other uh, departments, they might be having a limited information or less information in their hand. For example, the engineering and the you know manufacturing department. So, these guys are more into involved in their day to day work, right? And they are not exposed to the outside world. So, it could be possible that they have less information in their hand on, in comparison to the purchasing agents, right? And now, because of uh, the exposure, the purchasing agent can be more biased or partial towards a particular brand because he, according to his knowledge or his information, he would say this brand uh, has grown up very fast and it is doing pretty well in the market at the moment. But on the other hand, the production department or the manufacturer might say, no, we have been using this uh, particular brand of machinery for the last 20 years and it has given us no problem and our people are experts in handling this kind of any defect if it comes out in the machine. So, we will uh, continue with what we are doing. Now, there it can be a clash uh, because the information that you have in your hand, right. The third thing is active search. Now, active search for information is often relegated to the purchasing agents as, as I just said right now, right, because it is their job responsibility. Now, what is the definition of a purchasing agent? I have just uh, written it for your benefit. He is like a purchase manager who heads a team, right, responsible for procuring goods and services for the resale or the company use, okay. So, what do these people do? They seek the best available quality at the, for the lowest price. So, but obviously, lowest price here does not mean the lowest price. 
it is a trade off or a balance between the quality and the price at which point they may feel okay, at if I want to uh, focus on a particular level of quality this is the price I am going to get this is my optimal price right. So, they evaluate the suppliers negotiate the contracts and review the product quality. They are also known as sometimes purchasing director or supply managers ok. So, this is the third point uh, you know in the uh, task expectations and all. The fourth is a very difficult thing to understand. Now, it is called perceptual distortion. Now, Robbins has given a definition in which he says what is uh, perception? A process by which individuals organize and interpret their sensory impressions in order to give meaning to their environment. So, he says it is a process right perception is a process by which the individuals try to interpret the sensory impressions to give a meaning to whatever they are looking at they are feeling or observing ok. Now, when this thing right this can sometimes get distorted this can be distorted because of some new information coming in from the market or new signals being uh, coming from the market. So, what happens is individuals strive to make the objective information consistent with their own prior knowledge. So, whatever knowledge I have to I have got I will try to see it from th that point of view right. So, for example, this is sometimes uh, you know this is a trap we fall into like we try to see everything from a lens that we we wear right. So, if we are wearing a green colored lens, so we will see the whole world green right as good as that it is a very simple way of explaining to you right. And the expectations also systematically get distorted because of this reason because it is the way the knowledge we have that helps us to understand a particular thing in a particular manner right. Now, for example, since let us say there are substantial differences in the goals and values of the purchasing agents right the engineers and the uh, production personnel. So, one should expect different interpretations of the same information among them now because they have different goals and they have different approaches to life and even their you know uh, individual personalities are different. So, they will look at the same thing in a different way for example, the information about price of a product. Now, suppose somebody says the price of a product uh, some a company x y z is giving a discount heavy discount of let us say 25 percent right. Now, the same information may be perceived as a very good as a positive information by the finance department, the purchasing department, but the production department or other departments they might not look at it as a, with a very positive uh, frame of mind they might think that it must have compromised with the product's quality. So, now perceptual distortion is actually very difficult very difficult uh, to you know uh, remove it and it is very difficult to even quantify right. So, so normal survey methods or something they will not be able to you know uh, predict the or understand the perceptual distortion among people right. A more realistic alternative is to you know utilize uh, like concepts like perceptual mapping. Now, for example, if I show you what is perceptual mapping, perceptual mapping is like a you know a technique known as multidimensional scaling right in which we try to compare the differences in the judgment of the people of the various people involved in the purchasing process the agents engineers uh, and uh, the manufacturing guys everything right about certain brands and uh, you know uh, about certain brands. Now, let us take a brand right. Now, what we are doing is we will be placing quality versus price. Now, this is going on increasing right this is going on increasing this side right and this is obviously negative this is negative right positive positive. Now, we can place several suppliers or several vendors in different uh, zones now according to the price and quality by using this perceptual mapping. Now, perceptual mapping people are asked about their opinion the experts in the market are asked about their opinion and they will be placing a different uh, you know uh, vendor at different place for example, supplier 1 right supplier uh, 2 supplier 3, supplier 4 right and let us say these are the 4 suppliers. Now, we can understand that supplier 1 has got let us say this is the dotted line right a high price quality is not very high positive, but not very high. Supplier 2 is 
having a low price but a very good quality. Supplier 3 is having a very low price with a moderate quality, again a good quality. Now, so these kind of uh, placing on the on the map like a, a mental map helps us to understand where do these different suppliers lie and this will become a easy thing or a, a better approach for the organizations to evaluate their brands, you know products and suppliers. Okay. And the last point is satisfaction with the past purchases. So, when we talk about satisfaction with the uh, past purchases, so we are talking about past experiences with a supplier or brand now which may directly influence the person's expectations. Now, for example, you have been a user of let us say products from uh, TVS. Now, TVS uh, Sundaram is, uh, is, a, is a supplier to several uh, auto companies in the world. Now, one particular uh, let us say company who has uh, tried with uh, TVS Sundaram has feels that uh, TVS Sundaram products are at a very high level, right? Uh, very good quality products. Now, this automatically has got a halo effect in the brain, right? So, they are very satisfied with the past purchases and because they are satisfied, they would like to be more loyal or they would like to continue with the uh, company, right? So, it is relatively easy to measure the satisfaction variable by obtaining information to how the supplier or brand is perceived by each of the three parties, right? So, here the three parties I mean the you know agents, the quality control department and uh, the users, okay? All these things are very important. Now, look at his example. A supplier may be low in price, may be lower in price, but his delivery schedule may not be satisfactory. So, if that happens, now the finance guy still does not mind, but you know the production or the manufacturer, uh, manufacturing department will be very un unhappy. On the other hand, similarly, if a product's quality may be excellent, but its price may be very high, then the engineering department is very happy, but the finance department may not be very happy because they feel it is a, it is a, it, it, they have to cut down the cost, that is their primary job. Now, so these are some uh, important differences that we, or points that we saw that affects the right, the expectations. Now, coming to the model, if you remember, there was one important point that how to determine whether a company will go for a joint or a autonomous decision making. Now, let us say, why does a organization, why should a organization even think of it? For example, let us talk this, ask this question to ourselves. Now, when you are talking about let us say Tata Motors, right, Tata Motors. Now, I am saying why should Tata Motors be thinking about a joint or a autonomous decision making process? Now, is it required that because Tata Motors is a very large organization, they are making bulk purchase in a year and all. So, they should be looking at generally uh, a joint decision making because a lot of people may, may, must be involved could be, yeah, that is the major reason. But what if, if I say that not all products require a joint decision making approach, right? Some of the products might be, you know, okay, you, if you go for autonomous decision because the product might not be a very uh, large component or, you know, which does not, uh, uh, you know, involve a lot of revenue or something. So, and a sim single department can take a decision in that, they can take a call. So, what it says is not all industrial buying decisions are made jointly, right, by the various indi individuals involved in the purchasing process. And six primary factors are there which determine whether a buying decision will be joint or autonomous. So, there are six uh, buying decisions, okay. Now, what are they? Three of these factors are related to the characteristics of the product or service. So, uh, three uh, factors are related to the product, right, or service, okay. And Three other, if you can see here, are related to the company. So, what kind of a product, what kind of a company? So, three factors from the product, three, three factors from the company. Now, these six factors will determine, generally these six factors will determine whether the decision will be a joint decision making process or a autonomous decision making process. Now, looking at the product specific factors. Now, so there are three things. So, first point it talks about is perceived risk, perceived risk. Now, when you have used certain products or you have uh, attained certain knowledge about a product, right, of the various suppliers, various brands, various companies, right. Now, what kind of a perception do you hold about the risk or risk perception do you hold about this product? Now, greater the uncertainty in a buying situation greater the perceived risk, it says. So, for example, 
what is perceived risk? I will perceive the risk to be high if the uncertainty is high. Now, uncertainty can be a very tricky proposition. Now, what does it mean? Now, the uncertainty could be in the market for example. Now, because uh, you see recently a certain uh, large uh, uh, you know, events have happened which have increased the perceived risk for Chinese uh, suppliers for example. Now, because of COVID for example, the whole world started depending on uh, uh, which was earlier depending largely on China. Now, they started uh, perceiving it as a risk because they found that this strategy might not work if another such uh, pandemic occurs and uh, we will be in a loss. Now, again if you see a, another example, because of this uh, COVID pandemic and all, there was a significant drop in the demand for those chips and all. So, it was not available which automakers wanted. Now, that created a lot of uh, production problem issues. Okay. Now, suppose you are talking about a company which is a supplier, let us say the supplier is a brand, I do not want to write a brand's name for a negative point, but let us say a supplier is not reliable, let us say is not reliable, is uh, does not delivery on uh, time. So, just example, right. And uh, you know sometimes we find that the maintenance is high, right. So, in such a condition there are some few examples I am giving. Obviously, with higher uncertainty, right, the perceived risk is high, right. The second thing about the product is it talks about the type of purchase. Now, if the purchase decision is repetitive, it is just a routine you know work and is limited or is limited to maintenance of the product services, the buying decision is likely to be delegated to one party because you know it is a repeat work. So, you do not uh, need to spend too much of time and uh, you know uh, energy into that. So, what it says is basically the kind of purchase we are making is very important whether it is a repeat buy which is called straight buy or it is a modified buy with some minor changes or completely a new buy that means you are buying a new product all the uh, while. So, all these three types of purchases the buy that you are you know straight modified and re, uh, re, uh, new buy. Now, that will create uh, a uh, also an have an effect ok. okay. Now, the third uh, thing is you know that has an impact on your uh, you know uh, whether you are talking a joint or a dishes, autonomous decision making. So, in product related the third factor is time pressure. Now, if the buying decision has to be made, made under a great deal of time pressure or an uh, urgency right which is an emergency basis, it is likely to be again delegated to one party rather than decided jointly because it is an urgent work. So, you cannot uh, you know wait for you know uh, the whole all the you know the file to pass through a bureaucratic process and spend time you do not have the time right. So, so in these situations you will automatically look for a autonomous decision, but if it is a well planned right, it is a well planned strategy and you have enough time and all and it is a kind of a let us say new purchase. In such a situation companies would go for a you know joint decision making process because they can they understand that they can surely make some savings in this case. Now, moving from the product specific factors which affect the joint or the autonomous decision making, now we move on to the Second, the company specific factors. Now, what are the company specific factors? So, company specific factors are three uh, company specific factors. One, the orientation of the company. Now, what do you mean by the orientation of the company? Now, is it a company which is uh, you know highly technology driven or you know they are more into manual or semi auto or some automatic or something? What kind of a uh, company orientation they have? Now, many companies today are uh, you know they are depending on uh, the very latest technology right. So, uh, the 3D technology or some other technology and they are reducing uh, human intervention. Now, what kind of a company is this right. If the, the orientation of the company will influence whether a, the company should go for a joint decision making or you know whether it is a, a to analyze the amount of risk involved right or it is kind of a production oriented simple production oriented company. So, now that can also affect whether the decision is to be joint versus autonomous ok, joint or autonomous. Now, which one are you going to take? Sometimes 
the company size okay also has an importance now large companies for example large companies they will have a large big team and they will make immense uh, uh, huge volumes of purchase right so these are the companies where there are people who are uh, dedicated for such kind of job now if there are people who are dedicated for such kind of job so they would automatically go for a joint decision making process now for example let's say infosys uh, makes a yearly purchase infosys makes a yearly purchase of its regular supplies of let's say uh, 500 uh, crores right for all its different divisions now the point is it can have a large impact on them right so now the question is what kind of a decision would it take because it has a proper uh, team uh, in uh, available with it and all so it will might go for a joint right but let's say the company size is small it's a small and medium company right small and medium enterprise as you have small and enterprise with maybe 20 people or uh, you know even 50 people right or 100 people maximum so when you are having a small and medium enterprise generally the entrepreneur himself takes most of the decisions right generally he is the one who takes most of the decisions so in such a condition the decision becomes an autonomous decision making yeah autonomous decision making no doubt has a challenge i think everybody will understand and agree to that because it's a one man's decision and a one person's decision can be very dangerous one or two person's decision can be very dangerous they might, they might uh, overlook or oversight some of the very important points okay but a joint in the joint decision making process that doesn't happen because somebody uh, would be there to point out uh, one or two uh, one weakness right if there is any weakness somebody will surely point it out that's what the advantage you have and the third point is the degree of centralization so how centralized is your company is it a completely centralized or a completely decentralized company right <coughs> so if it is a completely centralized company that means all the decisions are being taken at the central headquarter okay so maybe they will plan out for a yearly plan out or maybe six month plan out whatever so they have done a plan out, pl planning and accordingly they uh, buy for all the uh, uh, you know dmus the different units right but if it is a decentralized unit let us say decentralized uh, let us say most of the MNCs are for if we follow a policy of decentralization. Now if it is a decentralized uh, you know uh, decentralization is there in that case the power is in the hand of the each individual unit right. So they can take their own decision at that place. So it is possible largely that if the centralization uh, it is more centralized then it say it will be a joint decision making process and if it is uh, on a decentralized level then you may go for a uh, autonomous right so this is a uh, possibility so largely what is uh, happening is that the size of the organizations obviously centralization and decentralization also get affected by the size of the organization right so all these things will affect whether the company should go for a joint or a autonomous decision making process well i'll uh, stop here and uh, i'll continue uh, the remaining part in the next lecture so i think today whatever i have explained you have understood it and uh, uh, thank you very much. So, let us meet in the next lecture.